We are beginning a brand new teaching series this Christmas season for the month of December. We're going to be talking about our royal faith and how that connects uh, to Christmas. You know, when you think about Christmas, um, it's more than just obviously uh, the decorations and even the delicious cookies, right? Christmas is um, really the most significant holiday, holiday on the calendar. It doesn't just get one day. It gets obviously a whole month and then some. Um, but it's tied to something very, very special that we want to talk about over these next couple of weeks together. See, every promise, every prophecy, every ounce of peace that we have, um, really every hope, every ounce of mercy that we tie our faith to is connected to the royal lineage of Jesus Christ. And over these next couple of weeks, we're going to look back at that and see how that ties in. And it's so very important for us. You know, when you think about the, the royal lineage of Jesus and the characters that are a part that are in his bloodline, um, it truly provides you and I with a message of hope, an inspiring message that perhaps in times like these is more necessary uh, than ever before. And so right there on the top of your outline, I want you to take notice of this first verse, and we want to get to it. Um, and it's found in Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter one. And you know, traditionally, when you talk about the Christmas story year after year, you have Luke's gospel, um, you have Matthew's gospel that gives us details concerning the birth of Christ, and of course, the many prophecies that are in the Old Testament. And traditionally, when we think of characters in the Christmas story, our attention goes, obviously, Jesus is the center of Christmas, so we know that to be true. Um, you know, Joseph and Mary, they get a lot of notoriety. And then, of course, you know, the shepherd boy with the Calvin Klein outfit on, okay? Uh, he's, he gets, you know, he gets some business there. And then you got the angel with the beautiful looking angel with the wings. And, and you know, the three kings, even though they come about 15, 18 months later, they're in the nativity. And it's all fine. It's all nice. Uh, but the Christmas story uh, is so much more than, than even that. There is a royal history, a royal lineage that is so important that enhances the faith that you and I have. And so I want you to take notice right here in the top of your outline. It's found in Matthew's gospel. It's the first verse of Matthew's gospel. And this is what we read here. Um, it says this, Matthew, the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Now the word book means record of, biblios in the Greek language, there's a record here, and the word genealogy means Genesis, the beginning. So the beginnings of Christ. And, you know, all four Gospels give us a depiction of the same person, Jesus Christ, but in a different way. Let's start from the Gospel of John and work our way back to Matthew's Gospel. John gives us the deity of Jesus Christ. In many ways, his genealogy of Christ goes back to, you know, before time began. And John, the pastor's heart, writes to the church. Dr. Luke's gospel gives us uh, the picture, really, of the humanity of Christ, because as a doctor, uh, that concept of uh, Jesus being fully God but fully man is an incredible uh, theological concept for him to wrap his arms around. And he gives us Jesus' genealogy through Mary's bloodline, which is important because Mary's bloodline ties to King David, and that gives Jesus, it helps him to fulfill one of the very important prophecies concerning his first coming, that Jesus had to be a blood, ultimately, relative of David. And so she takes it from Nathan, from David, eventually to Jesus. And then Mark's gospel, Mark gives us the picture of Jesus as the suffering servant. And slaves and servants of any kind, whether it was a house slave or, a, or, or some type of a farm slave, they didn't have any genealogies. And so Mark doesn't have a genealogy. Um, and Mark's gospel is primarily written to uh, the Gentiles. Mark having one Jewish parent and one Gentile parent and being converted ultimately by Peter was who discipled him. Now you get to Matthew's gospel. And I have to tell you, it's exciting because Matthew's gospel is the perfect bridge from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And I'll tell you why for a couple of reasons. Matthew's gospel, Matthew's favorite word is used 38 times. It's fulfilled. What is that word? Fulfilled, okay? And it's mentioned 38 times. He also has 99 Old Testament quotations. That's more than the other three gospels combined. And so Matthew serves as this bridge from the Old to the New Testament. And he gives us the genealogy of Joseph 
and he takes it again all the way back from you know, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and then we'll eventually get to Jesus. And so he gives us the royal lineage of Jesus because there's something very important for you to know. You know, this is more than just you and I having a little bit of Christmas nostalgia right now. You and I just going through the holiday motions, okay? Uh, that we have something very special here, that every promise that we believe in is attached to a royal faith. And the gospels proclaim that, particularly here, these genealogies. Because in order for Christ to go to the cross as the royal substitute for my sin and your sin, he had to have royal origins. He had to have a royal lineage. He had to check the boxes of prophecy for him to be the Messiah and the promised king that we worship about in song and in practice and that we believe with a full heart that he is who he said he is. And so, my friends, we don't have a faith that's a fairy tale. As I said before, the Gospel of Matthew doesn't start off with in a galaxy far, far ago. No, there's a genealogy. There's a record. There's a pattern. And so, in your notes, I want you to take notice of two very important factors here concerning the royal lineage of Jesus. The royal lineage of Jesus, and, and repeat this with me uh, right here in your notes, Jesus' royal lineage provides evidence for a royal faith. Now, it does so practically, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But I want to talk with you just about a numeric way of understanding our faith. As you know, seven is a prominent number, not just for going to the casinos, okay? You got to remember that, okay? We'll play in lotto, okay? The number seven is woven throughout the Bible. The first sentence of the Bible, let's just take it, in Hebrew, in English, it's 10 words. In Hebrew, it's seven, seven words. And when you study this, you're going to find something that is called the heptatic structure. It is a mathematical expression. And there was a man by the name of Ivan Panan who immigrated from Russia and he graduated in 1882 with a PhD in mathematics. He's a mathematical genius. Shortly thereafter, he comes to Christ. And he then devotes the rest of his life to the study of mathematical expression in the entire Bible. And he compiles 43,000 pages of information. That's where you go wow, by the way, okay? Wow, okay, that's a lot. He then donates, help me out here. He then helps, gotta help me out. He then donates that to the Nobel Research Foundation. And he says, upon investigation, because from 1890 to, to, the, to the year he died, 1942, he dedicated his life to this study. And Nobel Peace, that's where you get the Nobel Peace Prize from. And he said, without a shadow of a doubt, the Bible is inerrant. It's perfect. And this number structure proves it. And I'm gonna give you more stats in just a moment, don't worry. And this is what they said. They said in response to him, as far as our investigation has proceeded, we find the evidence is overwhelming in favor of such a statement. Now, take that first sentence in the Hebrew. God created the heavens and the earth, seven words, but it goes on from there. There's an understanding, it's called gametria in the Hebrew. And the Hebrews, when they would write their scrolls, they had a numeric value for every word. So here's the scroll, and then if I'm copying his scroll, if I go through, this, say there's 15 lines on the scroll, and if I get to, say, the, the 13th line, and I'm off by a number compared to his scroll, guess what we do with my scroll? We rip it up and we start over. So they used a, their numbers were letters, and they did that to ensure accuracy, which I'm thankful for that because we hold in our hands the Holy Scriptures, and, uh, you know, there's an accuracy to them. And one of the reasons, practically speaking, is because of the gametry and way of copying the scrolls. And so the Hebrew reckoning, they would understand this. So everything had a number value. But interestingly enough, when you take and you go through, say, even the first sentence of the Bible, everything's divisible by seven. So there's 28 letters in those seven Hebrew words. Guess what? That's divisible by seven. There's three nouns with the value adding up to 777. God, heavens, and earth. That's 777. 
the, the verb created in the Hebrew, that's divisible by seven. The subject that's in the first verse of the Bible winds up being able to be divisible by seven. There's actually 11 features just in the first verse alone. I could go on, but I got to get to the Christmas stuff here, okay? Now, the chance in that happening is one in 33 trillion, okay? 33 trillion, significant. Now let's cross that over because you have to understand something. This isn't just the first verse of the Bible. This is through the entire Old Testament, the number seven in the Hebrew woven in, the number of completion, God's number. But you would think it would stop when you get to the New Testament, right? Because the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. Certainly, how's that going to happen in the New Testament? Guess what? It continues. And it continues in the genealogy. When you get to the genealogy of Christ, listen to these statistics here. There's, take the first 11 verses. There's 49 words. That's divisible by seven, seven times seven, right? There's 28 words that begin with a vowel. That's four times seven. There's 21 remaining words with a consonant. That's three times seven. There's seven words that end in a vowel. There's 42 that end in a consonant. That's six times seven. All 49 letters equal to 266. That's 38 times seven. There's 140 with a vowel. That's 20 times seven. There's 126 other words, that's 18 times 7. 49 words, uh, 49 of the words occur 14 only once. The other 35 occur more than once. There's 42 nouns, seven of them are not. Remaining common nouns have 49 letters. Male names, total letters equal up to 56, that's 8 times 7. And the female names total up and are divisible by 7, which ultimately is divisible with 14 with 7. 14 features. Now, the chances of that being, here it is, you ready for this? In case you're doing the math in your seat here, it's one in 678 billion, 228 million, 72,000. Wow. Very good, very good. Now, now, why do I bring that up? There's evidence. Now, this is all throughout the Bible. Even the last nine verses in the book of Mark, where heretics try to say don't belong in the gospel, there's 77 features in that alone. The number seven is woven throughout the scripture. And Ivan Panan, as a mathematical genius, as he was studying this, as others have, the number seven in the Hebrew and the Greek is woven out. There's evidences within evidences of the Bible. We'll get to the historical evidence in a couple of weeks when we go through the Gospel of Luke, don't you worry. But when you look at the genealogy of Christ, the genealogy of Christ gives us the royal lineage and it's supported with evidence that leads to a royal faith for you and I. We have a royal faith. You need to know that. We're not just believing in some fairy tale, some fable, that we sing these songs with conviction because we believe he's every bit of the promised Messiah that was destined to come from heaven. And if that is true, then every promise that is also in Scripture is something that you and I can hold on to. Jesus' royal lineage provides an evidence for a royal faith, but it doesn't stop there. As we now survey Matthew's genealogy, maybe you're new to the church, you might be, or new to the Bible, you might be thinking, oh, there's a bunch of holy people in there, right? No, on the contrary. Oh boy, the genealogy of Christ gives us a beautiful picture. We have a royal faith. I mean, here's another reason why. Why don't we say this one together, okay? It's right there in your notes. Jesus's royal lineage provides examples of divine grace. How beautiful is that? There's sinners in his genealogy. David's in his genealogy, okay? And we're going to learn about somebody today and relate her to the Christmas story. Rahab is in the genealogy of Jesus. The great, listen to this, the great, great grandmother of King David. Now, Matthew chapter 1 verse 5 this is what it says. And Solomon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. And so this is Joseph's line. Again, Luke's line, Luke's genealogy gives us Mary, bloodline to Christ. Joseph's a little bit different because Jesus wasn't conceived under natural means. Jesus was conceived supernaturally. Now, there are those who try to contend and say that that's not true, that didn't happen, and they're entitled to their belief, but don't let anybody ever tell you that the Bible teaches that. The Bible makes very clear in both the New and the Old Testament 
that Jesus Christ was born of the Holy Spirit. Now that's important because in Joseph's genealogy, there was one of the descendants of David that uh, it was a shady character and there was a promise that was taken away from him and had it gone through Joseph, that bloodline would have disqualified Christ from being the rightful heir to the throne of David. So he has this supernatural conception and birth for that matter. And we arrive here at verse five and we read about some characters and one of them in particular is Rahab. Now, who's Rahab? Is it is she a saint somewhere? I don't, remember any, I don't remember going to St. Rahab Church, you know, or something like that. I don't remember anybody getting the confirmation name Rahab, okay. Why? Well, Rahab might get a, get a bad rap, but she's an incredible woman of faith. But she didn't have a great start, right? Sounds like you and I. Rahab was a harlot from Jericho. But somewhere along the line, this woman came to faith in the living God. And God uses her. Listen to this. God uses the harlot for his purposes. And she is a legal, rightful descendant of Joseph, making her a descendant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's just like God, my friends, to put people like this, not just in the, the nativity scene, because Rahab don't get a statue, right? But it's just like God to put a Rahab in the story for every person, every sinner like me and you to know that God's divine grace has royal attachment to it. The Christmas story is about royal faith. Evidentially speaking, and the examples of sinners like Rahab. So the story of Rahab then, how does it reflect to Christmas? Well, obviously, because of the grace of God. But now specifically to a character who we love, who gets his own little ornament, Joseph. Because how God treated Rahab, showing her grace and not shaming her, is the same way Joseph treated Mary before the angel gave him the rest of the story, right? And Joseph, and I said it before, God wasn't going to choose two bums to raise his kid. He picked Mary and Joseph, and they weren't perfect. They'll be the first ones to tell you when they get to heaven, um, but they will forever remind you and I of the examples, humanly speaking, of where we need to be aiming for in terms of our own faith in Christ. And Joseph reflects the grace of God in how he treated Mary because he found out she was with child, but he didn't have the other part of the story first from the angel. And we're going to explain that in just a moment. And so it's ultimately reflective of how God reaches and reveals his love and grace to you and I. And in turn, how we need to be to each other. And so... Let's keep it in Matthew chapter 1, and throughout the month, we'll continue to go back and forth into the genealogy, but we're going to jump to verse 18, and verse 18 now picks up, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place this way, and again, that ties to verse 1, you know, took place this way. He just gave you 17 verses of the genealogy from Joseph's line, all the way from Abraham. He took it all the way back then. And even that, there's three sets of 14 that he uses. And again, the Jews would understand all of this because of the gametry and way of accounting and memorizing. And so now he says, and now we get to Christ, the birth of Christ from Abraham to Christ. In other words, what Matthew is communicating is, is that every bit of those promises to Abraham and David, those covenants are now going to, we're going to see them, they're going to be displayed in the life of Christ in the new covenant. And so now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, now notice it says, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. Again, the Bible giving us the record. Mary had no relations prior. She was doing it right in every which way you could. And we must understand that it wasn't Joseph's not the earthly father or Nimrod or, or Sham down the block or anybody else. Nobody was the father. Um, the Holy Spirit allowed this conception to happen. And the Bible makes that very clear. We must understand that because the virgin birth is an integral part of understanding salvation because in order for him to be the royal sinless lamb of God that went to the cross, he had to be without sin. 
and it's on display for us here with the record. And so it says, again, that she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's only one problem as we read this, friends, is that Joseph doesn't have the angel yet confirming what Mary said. So if you're Joseph, you think she's what? Crazy. Not only is she a cheater and a liar, maybe she's lost it all together. Maybe it's a little bit of both. See, we read the Christmas story and we take for granted. We think these people are perfect. Some of us come from certain types of backgrounds and religions where, where we think we're perfect and or, or certain characters in the Bible are pretty, is a way to achieve uh, some type of sainthood, some type of perfection. The Bible teaches no such doctrine. And furthermore, as we look at this account here, we see that Mary and Joseph, they had their own I issues. They weren't perfect. But Christ is, and this conception is. But Joseph could have easily just turned heel on this whole thing. And, and he, listen, he could have shamed her. He could have did that. He, he could have had her stoned. You know, today people love shaming people, right? They take out their phone and they love shaming people. Then they go and post it, right? I, I've watched videos where there's people getting mugged and beat up and jumped. And, and people are just filming it. Nobody's jumping in to help. We're jumping in to help, though. But we're, we're going to video because we got to put it on. We got to post it. Oh, Oh, heavens to Betsy, we don't post something we do. Oh, boy, we, we got to post everything we do. And people even do that when there's crime going on. Going on. Nobody's helping anybody. But we got to post it. We got to post it. Well, they didn't have social media there. And I guarantee, even if Joseph had an iPhone or an Android, he wasn't going to post about Mary. He wasn't going to go hashtag annoyed, hashtag betrayed. Not Joseph. <laughs> Not Joseph one bit. He wasn't going to do it. Why? Because Joseph reflects God's grace to us. Joseph doesn't have the information yet. Yeah, Mary's told him, but you put yourself in Joseph's sandals, as I've said before. That sounds ridiculous. I'm pregnant, and God and the Holy Spirit did it. What? And that's what's going on here. But look what verse 19 says. How beautiful is this? And her husband, Joseph... Can you say the rest of it with me? Being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolve to divorce her quietly. Let me just explain to you something. Engagement in this culture is a lot different than today. I mean, you got engaged, it was a big how do you do, and it usually lasted a, the betrothal period and everything. You know, you're talking at least 12 months. And Joseph was probably building an addition onto the family's house. By the way, he's a carpenter, so he probably had like uh, the best wood treatment and doors and banisters that you can have. I mean, he was getting this house ready to go. And now the girl of his dreams, because again, Mary is, you know, an incredible woman. At least he's thinking up until this point, maybe she's not. And he's thinking, you know what? She's now the biggest fraud in the village uh, because now she's pregnant. And so I'm sure all of his dreams, all of his hopes, uh, the happiness that's associated with an engaged couple has gone down the drain for him. Um, but the Bible says that he's a just man and he didn't want to shame her. He didn't want to post on her. He didn't want to break her down any way. And the fact that he says he's going to divorce her quietly, even without TV and social media, you don't just divorce somebody quietly in their culture. He's, in other words, he's saying he was going to have to move away from his family and go to a far off land and divorce her there. He did not want to shame her. And this reflects the heart of God because God doesn't look to shame me and to shame you. I mean, what if God put my stuff and your stuff on the screens right now? We'd have to add services, folks, okay? But God doesn't do that. He doesn't, as I've said before, rub our face in our sins. He sent his son to rub them out. And Joseph is an example of this. And so there's a biblical principle here because here we're, we're tracing in this message our royal faith. And our royal faith is filled with grace. It's filled with mercy because of God's, God's goodness to us. And so write this first principle down. Budget for blunders and burdens. Can you say that with me? Budget and burdens. You know, Joseph had a big budget for this, didn't he? He had a big budget. You know, some of us, you know, we, we want God to have a big budget for us. Oh, we, we love God's big budget of mercy and big budget of grace. Oh, give me that big budget of goodness. But when it comes to budgeting, 
for other people. Oh boy, we got, we're very low on resources, okay? Banks closed, okay? That's how we are. But people have been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. How much more should we be a forgiving, kind-hearted people who show grace to others? How much more? Now, I'm not saying we got to be people's doormats because you can forgive somebody, but trust needs to be reestablished. That's something different. But at its core, understanding, Joseph reflected the heart of God, reflected God's treatment of Rahab. And in turn, we need to reflect that in our relationships. Christmas is a beautiful time of the year to circle the wagons and take inventory of what matters most, to clear the cobwebs of confusion out of our head, the selfishness, the ego, the narcissism, the pride, all those things that get in my way and get in your way over the long course of a year, especially a year like this. And really, when you begin to circle the wagons, what does it always come back to? The cross, the grace, the mercy of Almighty God. And the Christmas story is not void of that. It's full of that. And we see that here in in Joseph's example. See, how do you handle your people problems and your adversity? You know, I heard about this family that took in a boy. The boy happened to be their relative. See, um, his parents had died, and his brother was the next of kin, and legally he had already put down that he was going to take the child in. And they already had two children. So the two siblings, when the cousin came into the home, they didn't treat him very well. Now, all the kids had chores. The parents were, you know, good parents like that. They had chores. And the the cousin that came into the home, he was now in charge of the food, you know, uh, cleaning the table, setting the table, bringing the food when mom cooked it and putting it on the table. And everybody else had chores. Now, the the two other siblings, um, they, they prayed practical jokes on their cousin. They would tie his shoes together under the table. They'd lock him out of the house. Um, they, would, they would change stuff with his schoolwork. I mean, they really gave it to him. And the parents noticed this, and they got involved. They, they weren't passive parents like a Jacob in the Bible. They got involved, and they, they sat everybody down, and the kids had to apologize to their cousin. And so they apologized to their cousin, and he said, well, that's okay. And everybody was like, wow, he's taking that really well. And the kids said, well, it's just okay? You don't care? And he says, yeah, I don't care. I'll stop spitting in your soup and meatloaf every day. <laughs> You know, let me ask you a question. How do you deal with people's blunders? Well, God don't want you spitting in soup, okay? Or meatloaf or anything else you eat for that matter. There's a productive way to handle things. You know, a lot of us, we walk around with a grudge list. I wrote to you about this last week. A gr- I got my grudge list. This one's on the list, the grudge list. And that's why you, you don't operate in the peace of God like you should be. You gotta replace your grudge list with a grace list. You gotta get a grace list going. Now, some people, they're gonna spend a lot of time on the grace list. You might even have to get an extra, extra grace list for some people. But make no mistake about it, the heart of God is that we would have a grace list. Take notice of what Paul wrote to the church at Colossae. These are really Christian virtues, by the way, in Colossians, 3.13. Can we say this verse together? A great verse to commit to memory. Together. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. That's the perspective for you and I. God has shown us grace. We need to show others grace. You know, we should major in this, shouldn't we? I always like to think that a true sign of Christian maturity shows up in how we treat people. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to cross each other. We're not going to agree. But God doesn't want us being disagreeable. God doesn't want us, you know, just just hating on people or just leaving a problem. It don't work that way. God wants us to forgive. Now, certain people, they need to be put in the doghouse. We understand that, okay? Uh, For things they keep doing, they need to get help. We understand that. There's a difference. But for a majority of the little issues that we have with each other, by you and I consulting the message of the scripture, we could apply the same attitude and actions of the Lord Jesus Christ. After all, Philippians 2.5 says to have the same attitude of that of Christ Jesus. We got a budget for the blunders and the burdens of others. And if we could do that, we too can be reflecting the Lord. You know, when I think again about Joseph, 
He didn't want to shame her. We live again in a society that wants to go, I got you. We can't wait to go to somebody. I told you so. I got you. But that's not God. That's not his will for me and you. He's called you and I to operate at a higher standard. He's called you and I to make a budget. How's your budget looking today? You know, go adjust your budget. God wants you to be a Christian who is extending grace. And even if you don't know the Lord yet, this will fix a lot of problems when you see yourself through the forgiveness that God has offered to you through his son, Jesus Christ. There's power, truly there's power in the cross and the empty tomb. We have a royal faith. Remember that, a royal faith. Now, as you flip over your notes, we continue in Matthew's gospel here, looking at verse 21, verse 20 now. Now, I don't know about you, but I wish the angel, if I'm Joseph, would have came on the front end to save me a little agita, right? Okay. You know, that would have been nice. Okay. When they get to heaven, I'm going to ask Gabriel, hey, why'd you leave Joseph hanging here? Okay. But anyway, look what it says here in verse 20. But as he considered these things, I'm telling you right now, if you're as a man, Joseph is thinking, who did it? I'm going I'm to get one of my two by fours here and I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to show him who's boss. Who was it? He may have been going through some guys that have been trying to make time with Mary in the past. Who knows? Listen, guys start, the guys start doing things like that, right? Who did it? He's thinking about these things, but I don't think he's caught up in that really. I'm just joking. I think really he's thinking about how he is going to move, how he's going to tell his family. This is going to ruin his reputation. This is going to ruin his credibility. He's going to seem like damaged goods in their society. He's thinking about the ramifications of divorcing this woman and it now becoming public news. He thought about these things. Now, now the angel, it's like heaven said, okay, that's enough. Okay, let's get this guy off the hook here. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, okay? This is what we would call in theological terms as a revelatory dream. And so the angel reveals truth to him. And most likely it's the angel Gabriel, because as we've said before, he's the angel that's on you know birth announcement duty. And so he goes to Joseph and he says, Joseph, son of David. And notice how the angel picks up on the royal lineage, okay? Joseph, son of David. And that's why when you've read through the Bible, you go, why do you keep saying son of David? Well, because he has a royal lineage. That's why. He has a royal seating. He's a royal descendant of King David. And so Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now, did Joseph in his dream and his sleep go like this? <laughs> You know, I don't know. Uh, when you get to heaven, I'm sure there's going to be a long line to talk to Joseph, guys, when you get there. But every man could learn, every person could learn from Joseph's attitude and demeanor. The angel now fills him in. But prior to even that, Joseph, I think now why I think the angel didn't come till this point is because God wanted to give us a very important fact of our relationship with him. And you might want to write this down. Combine faith and action to move forward. This was a calamity for Joseph of epic proportions. His whole life was going to change if this was indeed true that Mary cheated on him. This was a major problem for him in his life. And notice Joseph's able to move forward by combining his faith in God. We see that by evidence of how he treated Mary. And then by these steps to not shame her and do what he was going to do. It's a combination of faith and action. And faith and action is a very important factor in your Christian life as well. We need to be people who are taking steps of faith. It's vital that we believe and that we do it that way. Now, Rahab, right? Rahab is the example that we're looking at. When you go to the New Testament, Rahab is mentioned as an example of faith and action. Take notice of what it says in James's epistle, in James chapter 2, verses 24 to 26. This is what James says. He says, so you see, we were shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. She was born, she was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by the road. Verse 26, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Now, what's going on? What's an element here? Now, you could go on your own and study Rahab from Joshua 2 to Joshua 6, particularly study the whole chapter of Joshua. That's one of our next steps, by the way, uh, to read chapter 2. But what is the heroic work of Rahab? Well, you see a little bit of it here now in the New Testament more, is that what happened was, was that God's men, uh, 
by way of Joshua's leadership, Joshua sent two spies into the land of Jericho, the Canaanite area, and he had these spies spy out the land, and their job was to bring report back. Now, when they went there, well, guess what? The king of Jericho found out, and so what Rahab does is, is she actually gives safe harbor to these two spies, and she begins to explain uh, to them uh, who she is, and they explain who, who they are, and they have this conversation, and she makes very clear she professes faith in God, and she professes faith in the living God, and they make an, ultimately they make an agreement with her to work with her, and it's because of her that they were able to go and ultimately uh, defeat what was going on in Jericho. She becomes a prominent figure because she trusted God and she helped God's people. Who would have thought this harlot would have such an important fact? But she put faith to her actions because they made an agreement with her. It was actually threefold. They said to her that, you know, if you're going to do this, then you need to put a scarlet robe out of your window and we'll know that, that you're not to be touched and destroyed and your, your whole family must stay in the house, and then don't turn on us, by the way. Don't, don't, don't double-cross us. And so those were the three agreements. Now, what's interesting about all of this is that Rahab says to them that I heard about your God. I heard about what your God did, of the crossing of the Red Sea. You know, the crossing of the Red Sea was a magnanimous event in the Old Testament. As I've said before, what the resurrection was in the New Testament is what the Red Crossing Sea of, was in the Old Testament. And she says, I've heard about how God has provided for you. I know this is true. And she explains her faith. And then she says something else. You know, I also want my family to be saved through all of this, which shows you she's a pretty good woman here. Now, think about how her family must have received this information because she went and told her family, I got two guys. And they probably said, of course, you got two guys over. Of course you do. Okay. No, no, no. It's not like that. It's not like that. I'm a change woman. I'm a change woman. And these are two Hebrew men. They're God-fearing men. They believe like we, like I've been telling you about. And this is what they said. And so she puts her faith, she puts action with faith, and she's a great example. And so before we move on to the last point, I got a question for you, a very important question. If we were in a court of law right now, the judge, the jury, the stenographer, everybody, would you be convicted of being a Christian? Would the jury of your peers have enough evidence to say you are a believer in Jesus Christ? Would there be enough circumstantial evidence, enough eyewitnesses, enough testimony to say that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the promised anointed Messiah from the tribe of Judah? Would it be that way? Would you be convicted? Is there enough action to back up your faith? You know, I believe it was uh, the great Augustine who once said it this way, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. Is there action in your life? Is there commitment in your life to Almighty God? Is, are, are you sold out to the things of God? Now, I leave this before you because Rahab had this amazing faith in action without the cross, without the manger, without the empty tomb. How much more should you and I be committed to a holy God and to the things of God? Rahab believed. Joseph believed, and we need to as well. Now, as we button this up, look at the last verse that we'll end on with Matthew's gospel. This is what the angel continues to say. How beautiful is this verse? She, that being Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, I like that. You know why? Because we got some sins here, don't we? We be having some imperfection, right? Is that true? We sinners here, right, aren't we? Is this a sinner in church, right? We're a bunch of sinners saved by the grace of God. And I'm thankful that this is here. This is a reminder. Jesus didn't come to start a religion. He didn't come to start a denomination. He didn't come to start a political movement. He didn't come to liberate a city or a country. He, he didn't come to balance a budget. He came for something much greater. He came to be the sacrificial, royal, sinless lamb of almighty God. And in order for there to be a royal atonement, there needed to be a royal birth. 
And in order for there to be a royal birth, there needed to be a royal lineage. And it is significant because we need some saving. God's people need some saving. You know, God saved Rahab, and God could save you and I. That's why his grace could be understood as being divine. You know, humanly speaking, you might throw somebody like Rahab under the bus. Forget about her. Let's get somebody else up here. No, not God. God has these women. And by the way, women weren't even allowed to be in anybody's genealogy in ancient times. They weren't allowed to give testimony in a court of law. But God has these women in here to show his grace and to show his favor and extends to you and I today through his son, Jesus Christ, that he came to save his people from their sins. And so write this last principle down, if you will. Shake free from shame by standing on my salvation and sincere commitment to God. I know that's a mouthful. Why don't we say it together? Shake free from shame by standing on my salvation and sincere commitment to God. You got to stand on your salvation. You know, what do we usually do? Some of us who grew up in certain different faiths like me, who has a vowel on the end of his name, it was what? Holy water. You know, you got to put the holy water on you, okay? Now, you can only have so much holy water. I got to take a bath in the holy water too. Uh, you know, we're rotten sinners. I'm a rotten sinner. Well, we don't need holy water. We don't need sacraments. We don't need to tip the offering basket four or five times uh, to get even with God or get on the right footing with God. Christ has taken care of that. And the only way to shake the shame of your past is through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. And we see that here in this story that it's attached to him not wanting to shame Mary. And the angel communicates this message. And for you and I, we must hold on to this because some of you, you know, you're still carrying around things and you need to let them go. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. We need to walk in those things. You know, the enemy has a warfare that you need to know about. And that warfare is shame. It's like, it's a, it's, it is a weapon of mass destruction that the enemy has. And he wants to shame you into disrupting and really isolating and disconnecting you from the fellowship that you need to be in with God and God's people. And that's what the enemy tries to do. But the birth of Christ is a reminder that Christ has come to not only break the chains of sin, but to shake the residual human shame that we carry on here in, in this world. You know, we won't have that in heaven, but until we get there, we're going to carry around uh, the shame of our mistakes. But Christ has paid for it in full. And we want to walk in that. And we want to have a hope in that. And that is exemplified as well in the life of Rahab. Now, you might be familiar with Hebrews chapter 11. It's called the Hall of Faith. Now, those of you who like sports, you've heard of the Hall of Fame, right? We might, got a, we might have a few future Hall of Famers here, right, in, in sports one day, some of our younger kids one day, okay? Don't forget old Pastor Ray when you make it, okay, one day, all right? All right? Couple over there, a couple over there. Don't forget, don't forget us, okay, when you make it to the Hall. Well, before you make it to the Hall, don't forget us, okay? But there's something called the Hall of Faith in the Bible. And wouldn't you know, not only who's in the hall of faith, but who's listed at the back end of the hall of faith? Yes, Rahab. Hebrews 11.31. Can we say this verse together about Rahab? Well, actually, I'll just say this verse, okay? It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to those spies by faith. Rahab was standing in her faith. And I submit to you today that you want to stand in your faith more than ever before right now. You know, there's probably never been more of a time in my lifetime and in your lifetime where lies and confusion and the evil, really, truly Isaiah 520 that says there are going to be those who call, you know, good evil and, and evil good. We're living in that again like they did in Isaiah chapter 5, but it's prophetic without a doubt. We're living in those times and more than ever before, we need to stand in the commitment and the really the cohesiveness, the confidence, the confidence of the word of God more than ever before. We need that. And the birth of Christ, we have this royal faith. Again, not a fairy tale, not a fable, but something factual. Something that will help fortify you and I in these difficult times. Because just as the walls of Jericho would indeed crumble, Rahab and her family were okay. They were saved from the scarlet robe. And it's the same way that you and I are saved because of the scarlet blood of Christ that flowed from the cross at Calvary. 
And we must never forget that. Not now, not ever. And when you look at this story, it's a reminder again to keep on keeping on. Because everything else is sinking sand, isn't it, around us? Because the walls of this world will crumble one day. But those of us who are attached to the scarlet of Jesus Christ will not. There was a woman who was celebrating her 100th birthday, and they do this more in the South, I guess, and the paper wanted to interview her because she was a faithful member of her church, and she was in control of all of her faculties. You know, her family had a fight with her. You know, some of you have people like that. They still want to, she still want to do her own shopping and, and this and that and everything like that. You're 100 years old, and, and you know, she was committed to her church. In fact, she was at her church for 80 years. She outlived some pastors. She was even older than the organ, okay? That's how long she was there, okay? All right, it's a pretty, pretty amazing woman. And so the papers interviewed her about her life. And she had what we might call, right? Some of us might call a checkered past, okay? Anybody here with a checker? You don't have to raise your hand for that, okay? Some of us have a checker. Some of us have checkers and dominoes and other pasts too, okay? We understand. So uh, listen, welcome, okay? All are welcome here and at home, okay? We're welcome at the foot of the cross, right? Now, what we must realize is, is this woman, what a testimony she gave, 100 years old, to the papers. Because they asked her, they go, you know, um, you know your testimony, we hear it, and um, you know, how don't you let the shame of your past ever hold you back? You know, 80 years being a member of a church, the same church, that's pretty awesome. And she, she said, well, whenever the, the, the devil tries to tempt me or guilt me into looking back, I sing this hymn. And it's the 1884 hymn written by Edward Morth. And this is it. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. We have a royal faith. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of every Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah. He is indeed the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the promised anointed Messiah of the Hebrews. He is the fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy, of the prophecies in Isaiah. He is indeed the prophecy of Malachi in its full fulfillment. And as sure as his first coming is, is as sure as his second coming will be. We have a royal faith. Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. And you have every reason to believe every bit of what God has said in his word, because it is true and it is perfect. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the perfect royal counsel of God stands forever. If you believe that, say amen. amen. And so this Christmas season, I pray more than ever that you know that Jesus Christ is every bit of the promised salvation that God said. Tomorrow is not promised to you. Heck, the next hour is not promised to you. But heaven is in Jesus Christ. I pray you know him. You know, don't just have a religious faith. Don't just think you're going to get in on grandma's faith or your uncle's faith. Or No, you got to have your own royal attachment to this, your own royal faith, right? you got to believe that Christ is the perfect son of God that was born into this world that he died for your sins, and on the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he is now seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And if you believe that, and if you repent of your sins, your name is written in what's called the Lamb's Book of Life, the Royal Book of Life, right? You know, as we close, I'll leave you with this last thought. I'm not a card player, but in cards they say a royal flush is an unbeatable hand, right? Well, let me tell you, a royal faith is an unbeatable hope. Never forget that, okay? Never forget that. You have an unbeatable hope 
in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, in times like these, oh God, everything else is sinking sand, but not you, not your promises, not all those sevens woven throughout the Scripture, not those names that are covered in grace, and not our names, oh God, and if we've professed faith in you that are written in the book of life, Lord, you know our failings, you know our comings and our goings, but you know that if our faith is in your Son, Jesus Christ, we are justified, we are forgiven, and we have a royal faith. We have a mandate not to give up, to keep on keeping on, to trust in you with all of our heart, not to lean on our own understandings, but in all of our ways to acknowledge you, trusting that you will indeed make our path straight. You indeed are every bit of the promised King and the Messiah. And especially this season, we hold on to these promises and we sow them with a full conviction of our royal faith. We sow these prayers now in the name of Jesus, our royal King, we pray, amen.